we'll see. In, in uh, text mode, sometimes so, there's an RO resistor. Yeah, so that's the resistor that represents earlier packed. Oh, okay. For discrete devices, you don't have to worry about it. Usually the earlier effect is uh, small. Okay. So we didn't cover that. And you should be safe. Okay, uh, so I'll go through some small signal examples today. Um, so I have one thing that I wanted to check with you. I am not here on AP of the second. It's a Tuesday. And uh, it's a long lecture. It's a 90 minute lecture or a two hour lecture. Can we stay for an extra 20 minutes for Fridays to make up for that time that we lose over there? It's an extra minute, 20 minutes on Fridays, and then we cover all the material that we need to, and then that hopefully is enough. To you mean an extra 20 minutes of lecture in our tutorial time? Or yeah, 20 minutes in, in your tutorial time. So no, I'm not going to go past the tutorial. Okay. So in, you know, the first uh, 20 minutes of the tutorial time, just keep going. Okay. All right, so uh, following up from the stuff we discussed in the previous meeting, the previous lecture, we learned that We normally bias, but this is our preferred bias method in most situations, the H bias technique, that we use this combination of resistors between the emitter and base to set whatever RIC we want here to the collector of the device and some VCD that depends on how we want to use the device, how big the signal and the output of this device is. Right? So the output may be taken from collector and meter usually. Um, but VCE comes with a voltage swing from which that node, either the collector or the emitter, can go up and down. And IC, we saw a couple of things in the last lecture, determines a lot of your small signal uh, performance measures. happens a lot, right? So when you make transistor amplifiers, you, in a lot of cases you have to add stages after stages after stage. And whenever you add a new stage, so in this case, let's say I'm taking the output from here, and this goes maybe to a low. Okay? I want to know what happens to the first stage when I attach my second one. Right? Because when we looked at the ideal model for an amplifier, we saw that it is modeled by an input resistance, an output resistance, and some gain. So if this has, let's say, an output resistance of, let's say, 10 kilo ohms, and the input resistance of my next stage is 1 ohm, what happens is that 
you only see one ten thousandth of the signal from this guy. The voltage division between the load resistor and the output resistance of this guy. So you want to make sure that when you attach this stage, the input resistance of this stage is comparable, preferably much, much bigger than the output resistance of that guy. Right? So you want to minimize that loading effect that these stages have on each other. And so therefore you need to know what is the resistance when I look to the right and what is it when I look to the left. That's the concept of impedance element, right? And then how do we calculate that? We said essentially it is your terminal resistance. Whatever technique that we used in the past to calculate the terminal resistance, we can use the same thing here. The method that we use more in electronics is that we use a test source. You can use your own method from circuit theory, that works as well. But maybe you have two or three sources. Then things start to become a little bit complicated if you use the the other thing. What we usually do in electronics is that, first of all, the concept of impedance at the node is a small signal concept. So I'm showing you the large signal model, but what you should do is that you should go and put the small signal model for each of these transistors in your circuit, calculate the bias points, all those things, and then you attach your test source. To open it up from whatever node that you're considering, attach your test source, see how much, let's say, current is drawn from your voltage test. Or if you're using a current test source, see how much voltage is produced across it, right? And that gives you an equivalent resistance here. Knowing that, you can replace all of that with just a single resistor. Make your analysis much more simple, right? Focus on this, for example. Or when you look back, you can replace all of that with just a one voltage source and a one output resistance value. And therefore, focus on this guy. Design this one. Okay? But remember, those are small signal quantities. So, you know, I said I want the input resistance to this side, or look back, or sometimes I said, what do I see when I look into that? The linear, all of those things. That's the concept of impeding this at a node. I'm showing it on a large signal model, but they are all these small signal quantities. Okay? So, we learned that. We learned the small signal model for a PJP is very simple. Same thing for MPN and PMP, right? Once you do the large signal analysis, the small signal model is exactly the same for both of them. Same polarity for V pi, same direction for GMP pi. So if you look at the small signal model, you cannot tell if the designer is using an MPN or a PMP transistor. You cannot say. Okay. So that's a review from the previous lecture. Now, um, let's look at a device here. I want to make an amplifier. What does that mean? I want to have a circuit based on this transistor in between a single source and a load, such that at the end of the process, when I do the calculations for my VIs, I deliver more power to the load than what I draw from the source. So let's model the source with a voltage source, let's say it is a voltage source, forget about the output resistance, and the load, let's just say it is a simple resistor. In between, this transistor will have its own biasing, will have its own collector resistance, emitter resistance, all those things. We do have, right? But the core is this transistor, right? Now, tell me, how many possibilities are there to connect these two components, the source and the load, to this transistor? I'm assuming it's super simple. I'm assuming that we can directly connect, let's say, the load to the collector, or the source to the base, or the source to the collector. We can do all of those things, right? So that's that. And I'm assuming the biasing is taken care of. So if you connect your source directly to the base, you are not putting this into cutoff or any other region. Biasing is not shown. Assume the device is properly biased. There is a network in the connector, in the meter, in the base to keep the transistor happy where we want it. What are the combinations for source and load? So let's say source and load. So for example, you can connect the source to the base 
and you go to the collector or to the emitter, right? So source can be connected to the base, load can be connected to the collector or emitter. These are two different circuits. You can connect the load to the, so let's say the source to the emitter and connect the load to the base or collector. And the same thing for the collector side, right? You can connect the source to the collector and take the output from the base or from the emitter. So you have six possibilities. Obviously, you do not connect them to the same. Right? There's no point. If, if you can connect the source and node to each other, to the same node, well, why do you pay for that uh, extra circuit in between? So these are the total number of possibilities here, right? So that we can connect the source and the node. Our goal is to have more power at the load side than what we have at the source side. So discuss this. Which one do you think is going to work? Which one do you think is useless? And tell me why. Um, well, I would, I would start off by saying connect the source to the base of the transistor and then connect the load to the um, emitter of the transistor. To this one? Yeah. Um, is good or bad? I would say that's good because you're now you're amplifying your current by your beta value. So you'd be... Um, this one does the same thing, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. That's where I'd start. So I get some current amplification at least. Yeah. All right. So let's give these two as potential good candidates. So let's say, I'm going to put the big mark here as potentially good. Right. What about the rest? So let's say, what happens if I connect my source to the collector? It's a voltage source, I'm connecting it to the collector. Uh, if I do that and take the output from the base or emitter, will I have an amplifier or not? No. Yeah. Why not? Well, there would be nothing to bias. No, the biasing is taken care of. So assume you have all the components needed in the base and in the collector terminal and the emitter terminal to bias it. I am, at, and I'll show you how you can do that later. But let's just keep it, keep the biasing out. If you collect the load to the base when you have like an amplifier. Sorry? If you collect the load yeah. to the base when you have an amplifier. No, you connect it. Oh, so why? Like it would shrink your output signal as opposed to amplifying the output. So good point. Yeah. Right? So I probably never ever want to connect the load to base. Because base has a attenuation value for the whatever current you have from the source. So if your source is connected to the emitter, it has to provide ID. But what you're delivering to the load is ID. That's beta times smaller order. Right? So I would never ever connect a load to the base. So Load to the base, this is bad. Load to the base, this is bad. What about, uh, so these two we are assuming is good. These two we are not too sure. So let's talk about this one for now. Connecting the source to the collector, taking the output from the load. Your current gain is about one. Right? Doesn't mean you don't have power gain. You can have voltage gain. Right? So what, what, yeah, what, is this a good combination or not? This was the last one. Source to the collector, load to the meter. Um, well, I don't think it would do much of anything in terms of amplification. Why not? Uh, well, because, I mean, they're only varied by alpha in terms of the current. Anymore. Yeah, but they cannot voltage. So yeah. if one voltage gain is two, yeah. they have power. Uh, I guess, but across there, <coughs> there the voltage would be, uh, I don't think the any other ideas? What do I have at the current, uh, sorry, at the collector of the transistor? I have a current source. How would that current source respond to a source that is attached to the collector? It won't. So you may have a variation of voltage at the collector, nobody else will know it. So this one will definitely not work either, right? But in general, you never attach a source to the collector. 
because you know this is a bad design for that reason as well. Because you put a voltage source on top of a current source, whatever the voltage here is, your current source just absorbs it, doesn't care. So that last one is not good. But this is the one that we are not too sure about. What about this one? What happens if I connect my source to the emitter, take the output from the connector? Current gain is about one, or maybe half, you know, slightly less than one. Sorry, could you repeat why connecting the source to the connector and the load to the emitter is bad again? Because this is the model for your transition. Run the load single model, small single model is the same. So this, you know, I have stuff down here, stuff down here. I don't know what they are. But I attach the test voltage for my input source lead S to, to the collector, and this is the let's say data ID or IS into the DB or whichever. Uh, that VS does not change the current. The current is set from somewhere else. So what that means is that whatever happens here, the emitter terminal or the base terminal, wherever you put your load at, will not even notice it. If you remember when we calculated ROC for the transistor, it turned out that that uh, current source is not responding to my source. It turned out that it's just an open circuit. So it is. Okay, so this time we should have our eyes on. It may or may not work. Uh, the answer is that it actually does work. It's, it's a good amplifier. Well. So these three are your possible combinations. Two of them, you connect the uh, source to your base. Two of them, you take the output from the collector. And then you have uh, three combinations that are useful for amplification. These two is the, you know, why these two can be amplified is a little bit more clear because we already have the beta factor for current, probably some voltage gain too. So you should have power gain here. This one, your current gain is about one. We are hoping for voltage gain. So if your voltage gain is 10, 100, whatever, larger than one, you should be able to get some power gain from this guy. You'll see if you can or you cannot. Right? But for these two, it's a little bit more clear cut. Let's look at this first one. Let's see. Okay. So what I have is a transistor happily biased. I'm not trying to bias it. Okay? So this transistor is biased through some magic. And let's say the emitter is grounded. I have established IC that I like. And my source is connected to the base. And I'm taking the output from the collector. The collector is connected to my load. So let's put my load here. I'm going to put my load between the collector and this VCC. So this way, you know, you can feel that the transistor can be handily biased if I have a little bit of DC voltage at the source. Here. So if, if this really irritates you, what I can do is that I can add a rebias to the source, to the base, such that I put this device where I want it. We already know we never bias this way, right? We never bias this way because you never bias with a fixed voltage across the path. But, if you keep things simple, let's just assume that's how we do it. So, you know, let's just say I see that you have here is, uh, in fact, I S into the, uh, let's say, the bias over here. Right? So you find, you've done your math, you found the right V bias to give you the right I C and right VC so that the device is in active region. Let's see if this guy can do an amplification for us, right? So I, I want to see what happens. So when I add VS to that terminal, well, let's look at this V out. Uh, 
So if, if this is IC without DC, is just DC C minus IC. Let's just call this IC G. Right? So that, that's all easy. Now let's see what happens when I add a small DS to that source. Well, I can still find IC from the same equation. So IC, because this is now this is AC source, this is a small component, small signal component. It's going to be IS e to the uh, D bias plus DS over D. And B out is DCC minus that expression times RC. IS RC e to the D bias. Okay. You can see a lot of this is your DC stuff, right? Because if DS is small, you know, the bias is going to dominate. You're going to be sitting at that initial point on your, you know, at your bias point. Then you add a little bit of DS, you're going to move a little bit, right? So let's just look at delta V out. What? Changes in the art that are caused by DS. The original point really not that interesting. <coughs> so if I look at delta V out, or if I write it in our small signal format, V out, that is going to be this is my second point, right? This is where I am now, and this is my initial. So it is DCC minus RC IS into the V bias plus Vs over Vt minus Vcc minus Rcis into the Vs. Oh, yeah. Right? So if I look at delta V out, okay, Vcc's cancel, I can factor out R C I S E to the V bias over V T. So it's gonna be minus R C I S E to the V bias over V T. Okay, and then what is left of that first term is E to the V S over V T <coughs> of the second term I have minus one. Right? So that's the expression for changes in V out. I notice that this is my RCQ. Okay? And then the other thing I do, we've done it a couple of times already. The other thing I do is that I go and write the Taylor series the expansion for this. If Vs is small compared to Vt. So Vt I know is about 25 millivolts. If my Vs is few millivolts, then I can write this as this. Okay, so tell me the inside. Taylor series expansion, it's 1 plus Vs over Vt plus one over 2 factorial Vs over Vt squared, and so on and so on. Okay, minus 1. And if my Vs over Vt is really small, then these higher order terms are negligible. When added to these two terms, once cancel, I will have only this value left. Suggested problems, homework problems, all those things that you've done. 
What is the typical RC IC value? What is the typical IC? Millions, right? Typical RC, kilos, right? So this is on the order of volts. What is this? 25 millivolts. So something on the order of volts divided by 25 millivolts. That is 40, 80, 100, easy, right? So you have an amplifier. And the good thing here is that this term can be much larger than one. So notice, there is something interesting here. Your voltage gain, this is my voltage gain. This is how much the output is larger than the input. If I divide the two sides by ds, that's my voltage gain. Notice this voltage gain depends on your DC voltage drop. It's weird, but it does, right? But that also shows you how important it is to choose the right IC. IC directly affects your gain, but ICRC affects your swing, right? So you have to keep both of them in mind. Anyway, we can have an amplifier. So is that term the gain? That's your gain. But why is it negative? It's not a financial gain. <laughs> <laughs> it's an electronic gain. Can be positive or negative. The magnitude is what matters. Oh, so right? okay. So the magnitude can because the, the negative sign in front of it it just means that there is a um, one eighty degree phase difference between your inputs and outputs. Oh, I'll show you an example. But the the magnitude of the gain is usually what you expect from an amplifier, right? The negative sign sometimes it bothers us. Very few cases. Most of the time, I don't care. If it really bothers you, what you usually do if your amplifier is giving, if your good amplifier is giving you a good gain, you go and put an amplifier with a gain of minus one after that, and then you fix the problem. So the the, the sign doesn't really. So, so we're saying that even though the magnitude of V out might be much larger than V in, in terms of positive and negative, it would be a much lower voltage than V in. Um, so I'm going to show you, and I want you to do this later if you have time, maybe the tutorial, maybe I'll do it now. What's happening to the keyboard? Okay, so I, I'm going to show you a simulation. Uh, who knows about the FT Spice? Yeah, it's a very good tool. It's free, unlimited, but you know, how much more do you want? The interface sucks, but that's because it's history. But it's good, and it has had this interface for the past 20 years with every month. So it's consistent too. That's good. Okay, so this is your device, right? I have one of your amplifiers here. I put some resistor up there, some bias voltage up there. And uh, this is my bias voltage, that is the V bias I just showed you. And this is your small signal source. It's a sinusoidal, 100 mm, oh, I'm going to change that. Uh, some amplitude and some frequency, right? So let me change the... Oh, here is the problem.
Oh, yeah, I have one IG on this over here. I want to look at it. That's right here. I do. <laughs> okay. Let me change this to this one and the signal. And run the simulation. So what I'm going to do... Well, first of all, you know how this thing works. When I switch the DC voltages. Right? So the first analysis I'm going to do here is that I'm going to change this DC value from 0 to 1. You know what's going to happen, right? Remember, zero volts, the device is off, output voltage is at your VCC, five volts in this case, then you enter sorry, active region, and then eventually if the uh, collector voltage drops to small enough values, you enter saturation. So we, we can have a look at that. And that's how you usually design. So this is my input voltage, I'm changing it from zero to one volts, right? And that's how the output is constant. So the horizontal axis is your voltage here, V1. The vertical axis is what you're unplugging. So V out, if you look at it, the transistor is off, 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 then turns on, uh, then at over a very short amount of, the short, uh, it's a range of, small range of voltages, input voltages, it goes from cutoff to saturation, and then it stays in saturation. So that's how I figure out that I need, let's say, 0.66 volts to keep this device happy, right? So that's how I figured out the value here. But so, maybe the graph, maybe the graph just isn't drawn, but it looks like that's not an amplifier. If you have a little bit of change in V in, um, like you have, even if you have a lot of change in V in from that. So you do not trust it. That's the so let's look at this. So I go from, I don't know, 665 to, you know, just pick two values. And let's say that. You know, five millivolts more. So I changed my, you can pick the values off. Right? From 672 to 676, almost, or, yeah, 75. So three and a half millivolts of change at the input. You have 279 to 306. A much larger change at the output, right? So it is an amplifier. But it can be an amplifier if you do the job properly. But anyway, so, so let's look at what happens when I apply my assignment to this. Oh. <coughs> Okay, so this is a sine wave, this is a nice and pure input signal. Um, one millivolt in amplitude, it goes into the base of your device, that's your output. Okay, so the issue is that you have a DC on top of your sine wave, right? So, so it's hard to see and compare them because they are not really changing around the same value. But you already see that the blue one is changing significantly more than the yeah. yellow one. Okay, so that's something that I wanted to talk later in this lecture. But tell me, how do I get rid of the DC on that blue line? How do I bring it under, let's say, it goes to zero level? I don't want to generate my signal. Okay? But how do I get rid of only the DC part? Keep the AC part. I like the AC part. But I don't have any, anything to do with it. Or I don't, do anything with the DC component. What do I do? How do I isolate the DC from AC? Capacitor. I use a capacitor, right? <coughs> so, this is, for example, what you can do. What I'll do is I put a capacitor here between the output node of my device and my load. This is my load, right? So it's an oscilloscope probe, it has a one million impedance. It's a high, high, large resistive load. But what this capacitor does for me is that whatever DC you have here is going to be blocked by the capacitor. If you choose a capacitor properly, your AC signal will go through it, right? And appear across your load. 
So, so that's the trick. So if I run this simulation again, this is your input now. This is the voltage on this side of your capacitor. You know, if you go on to that one only, you can see it's about 2.76 and it's changing around that. The capacitor flux is Flux all the DC for me. Right? And if you want to see the voltage as the output here versus here, now you can compare. That's an amplifier signal. Right? So now they are both around zero. We can clearly see that the output signal amplitude is much, much bigger. Let me make the gain a little bit smaller. So let's just go to, I don't know. N times uh, less, yeah, it's different. Okay? So the blue one is your input, the yellow one is the output. There is your negative sign. Right? You see the phase is inverted. The signal looks fine, it's just that you have one agent is your phase difference between the input and the output. Right, it is negative. That's a negative thing. What would happen if you change that like one mega resistor to like a one kilo resistor? Just what happened? It was just that. So let me put it back to what it was before we had it. Well, actually, you know what? Let's keep it at a handle because now you can see. You know, I have a gain of how much? Let's say around four. Yeah. Minus four forty, right? But it's a one mega ohm resistor. To the circuit here, this looks like an open loop. Why? Because over here the output resistance is how much you already should know. Looking down the collector of this guy, I see infinite. Looking up, I have only 100 ohms. When I look to the left, I only see that at 100 ohms. So the output resistance of this stage is about 100 ohms. Okay? One mega ohm is huge compared to that 100 ohms. But what if this was 10 ohms? Let's see what happens. Oh, I need to make two changes, I'll explain this one later. So let's just change this one. And let's do this same channels. I had how much gain? Four, Four and a half? Let's run it. Sixteen. You lost your signal, right? The basic is across this guy. It's across the output resistance of this guy. Your output signal is even actually smaller than your input signal. Right? So that's why we need to be careful about the impedances of these stages when we attach them to each other. It matters what you attach to the output of this guy. 10 ohm versus 100 ohm versus a kilo ohm, right? Uh, if I use 100 ohm, you see about half the signal. Half the signal here, half, that's actually how you can say what the output resistance of that guy is. So if I use 100 ohms, this is about half your achievable gain. So what is my gain? Yeah, so you can see that the, the output is now say, a good amount larger than the input. But if I make this and have this K, let's say, then the output will be much bigger. Twice as big as Okay? So that's why the, the impedance and the node matter, uh, the impedance and the node concept matters. This guy is an amplifier. You can play a few parameters to set the gain. You can play with the current. You can play with this RC value. We just saw that it's IC RC that gives you the gain, right? And then the capacitor here is very important because it separates the DC from this side and whatever you have from this side. These are called coupling capacitors. I use them to couple different stages into each other without affecting their DC bias points or whatever DC operating point. Right? I can have a second amplifier stage here, bias it the way I like it, and connect it to this through a coupling capacitor without worrying that the two will affect each other. The bias points are like totally separate. I can focus on each one separately to make my life easier. What's the price I pay for using the capacitor here, other than the price of the capacitor? It's a lot of money. Hmm? More money? Well, forget about the, the cost of the capacitor, oh. it's small enough. But what is the price in terms of performance? When I put a coupling capacitor between my amplifier stages, what is the price in terms of interference? Because the capacitor would almost act like an antenna. 
No, 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 no. You, you can talk about caloric frequency, don't worry about radiation or anything else. Hmm? Yeah, okay. Say it again. So in general, the, the rule of thumb for me is that how do I choose this capacitor? I make sure the impedance of this capacitor and the frequency that I like, right? The, in this case, the one channel, is much smaller than the resistances or impedances at all. So it doesn't affect it. It behaves essentially like a short set, right? But there is a price in terms of performance. Is that the phase check? Well, if it is a short circuit, there is no phase check. The price is that what if your source is a DC source or a slowly changing source? What if you're trying to amplify the signal from a thermal cup? Right? Goes through this, behaves more or less like a DC, your capacitor blocks. So the term that we use here is you have this capacitor in between the stages. You may have one at the input and also at the output of the device as well. It's AC coupled. AC coupling means that your DC from the input will not go anywhere through the circuit. Where have you seen AC coupled expression before for chat? You, you must have seen it in, I don't know, maybe 10 times by now. Have you looked at what it says on your oscilloscope screen, the menu that you go on down? AC couple, DC couple. That's what it is. AC couple means that they put a capacitor and they block the DC. Whenever you're looking at a DC signal with a small AC component, you use the AC coupling mode because you don't care about the DC part. You want to see the AC part, right? So same thing here. AC couple means that you have this capacitor in your signal drop. So your DC at any stage is going to be blocked. DC couple means if there's a DC change at the output, at the input, it will affect the output. So you do not couple them using this capacitor. They make your life easier, but sometimes you cannot use it. Sometimes you're amplifying the DC signal. Okay. So we talked about coupling capacitors, now you know what they are now. We have one other time that we discuss later. Uh, one of the group. Okay. Let's keep going. So we use uh, the first 20 minutes of the invention. Okay, so this was not too hard. This was not a lot of work, but pretty soon you can see that you know, if I have two stages, if I have three stages, if I actually go and include my biasing in here, things are going to get complicated if I use these dots in one model. So what do I do? I say, well, you know what? You have your transistor with biasing and all that. Okay? So you bias this device, you have established the IC that you want, and now you don't care about DC anymore. All you want to focus is AC performance. What is the gain? What is the input resistance? All those things, right? So I can just go and use the small signal model. So for this guy, for this circuit, how do I draw the small signal model? Draw your transistor first. Make sure the device is in active region. That's the first thing. But once you make sure that the device is in active region, I can draw the small signal model. So I'm going to add EC, get IC, then calculate here. And then the navigator. Yeah, sorry, off. Okay? So you first off at DC, find IC, then you can calculate the small signal parameters, then you can draw the small signal model. That's from my transistor. I usually draw my transistor first because it has the most number of pins and legs and everything. And attach the rest of the second components to it. Emitter is grounded, let's start with that easy one. So the emitter is grounded. My base, I only keep in the small signal model, you know, we did see that in uh, 
the diode circuit and we need to talk to them a little bit for transistors as well. We only keep stuff that are changing in my model, right? So in the base circuit, the DC source is not changing. It's, it has to be zero. So zero DC voltage means the short circuit, so that gone. But the AC source remains. That's that. On the collector side, again, this DCC at the top is not changing. It's a DC source. So in reality, you know, you remember that this is actually this is how we uh, draw it. But in reality, it's a DC source. Okay. So if I zero that DC source, DCC source. Then I have a short circuit to ground for the top end of that resistor. And this is my V out. Okay? Let's calculate V out. Easy circuit. So, what is V out in this circuit? I, I want to find the relationship between V out and Vs. What is V out? Let's start with an expression for V out and then see what we are missing. And then we can figure those out. What's V out? No, no, it's a small signal. There's no VCC. VCC is gone. I have a current source in series with the resistor. What is the voltage drop across the resistor? Yes. GM with my RC. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the current is going from ground up RC and into GMB. Yeah. So it's going to be a negative voltage at the VR. So it's going to be minus because the current is going up. The voltage here is going to be more negative than the voltage here. And how much current? GMB pi. What's the resistance? RC. Good. Okay, I need to find the relationship between V pi and Vs because I will see how we are changes as a function of Vs. So, what is the relationship, or what can give me the relationship between V pi and Vs? Let's say that V5 is just simply Okay. Here we go. What is AV in this case? AV is voltage gain. Okay. Um, so A is VR. So for gain, they use A or G or K. So AV is your voltage gain, AI will be the current gain, for example, if you want to do it. So the out of VS is GMRC. Set your IC, set your GM, that's your gain. For one milliamp of current, for a VJD, GM is about 25, sorry, GM is about 40 millisieverts. So right away you can see that with a one kilo ohm resistor and a one milliamp current, we got a gain of 40, negative 40. So this is a good, very clear that this can be an amplifier here. But how is this different from what we have up here? Over here, we calculated the gain. It was something that looked different. Is it different? It's the same. IC over VT is GM. Same result. But 
much, much, much easier to find it using this call signal. That's why we use this call signal. So you're saying you could either sort of look at it from a, a large signal uh, point, of, point of view and get the same result as you would when looking at it in a small signal way, except the small signal is easier to calculate. Yeah, so, so a small signal is an approximation to God's right. Okay. But if you satisfy the requirements, it's a much, much, much easier way of analyzing circuits. And the good thing about it is that it gives you insights about how circuit works. Right? It's, it's easier to see how the circuit works. OK, so uh, tell me, so this is an amplifier. It's a good amplifier. We actually just saw that it's a good amplifier. Tell me. When I bias this and want to use it as an amplifier, what is what can go wrong? What, what is the issue? Like, you know, if you go and make an amplifier like this and try to sell it, you go back. It has a good game. But what is the problem? Yeah. The bias point is not stable. Because you know, a little bit of temperature change will change your IC or IC changes, your GM changes, your device may go into saturation. If that doesn't happen, your game will change. Right? So that's not something you like. So how did we solve it? We added an RE. Right? So let's just do that. So let's look at that circuit again with that RE included. Oh, actually, let me just tell you one thing. So if you look at how the input is applied and how the output is taken. The input is applied between ground and base, and the output is taken between ground and collector. Oh, collector and between base and ground at the input side, between collector and ground at the output side, right? Since the emitter is grounded, you can say that the input is applied between base and emitter, and the output is taken between collector and emitter. So the emitter is the common terminal between your input and output, at least in this simple cell. The name of this stage is common emitter stage. Right? Common emitter means that emitter is common between your input and output voltages. That's the common term, and common usually is ground, right? The other way to think about it is that when you say common emitter, it means that neither the input nor the output is applied or taken from the emitter. It's the other two terms. And we can go back to the table up there that we had. And so this is your common emitter. What is this one? Common collector, and what about this one? Common base. Common base. So these are your three fundamental stages. Yeah, so how does adding the RD make the circuit better? Yes, so uh, DC, uh, DC, it makes your bias point more stable, right? So we talked about the radio here last lecture. I think that has to be the better. So come and see me after this, okay? So I'll tell you how it makes it more stable, but the, the point here is, <laughs> So let me just maybe quickly revisit that point. We are considering DC. If you're, this, this is DC. I want a stable DC bias point. So if some disturbance comes in, it could be a temperature change, it could be a VB change, it could be anything, it could be an IV change. So let's say if VB goes up, for whatever reason. I don't want the IC to move with it that much. But if VB goes up, right? Remember, IC is VB plus IERE. If VB goes up, your IC will go up. And then the temperature goes up and up. No, 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 just look at one disturbance for now. Just voltage, right? If VC go, VB goes up, IC goes up. If IC goes up, then the voltage here will go up. Because IC goes up means 
IE will also go up, and therefore VE will go up. If VE goes up, it means that VVE has gone down. But if your emitter voltage goes up, your VVE, the voltage drop here, has gone down. And this pushes IC down again. Meaning that if something wants to move IC, wants to increase IC, there's feedback mechanism here to pull it back. Okay? This gives you stability on the DC side. Uh, come and see me after this lecture, and then you can go into more detail. But that RE helps with that aspect. Let's say we added that to here, and we want to see how it affects my transit my amplifier. It is still a common emitter state, right? Emitter is not grounded anymore, but emitter is not playing a role in, it doesn't look like it's playing a role in your uh, signal route. It's still the common emitter state. Okay, so let's draw my small signal equivalent circuit. So I, I first thing I do is that solve at DC, always, always, solve at DC, then find IC, then find GM, and R5. Okay? Once you do that, you can go and draw your small signal equivalent circuit. So this is my transistor. On the base side, this is where I'm attaching my source. You know, this is where my source goes, and this is where I take my output. On the base side, I have my source emitter. I have an RE to ground. And then collector, like before, I have a resistor to ground. So is it clear that why this resistor is between collector and ground? Right? Because the other end is VCC. VCC is a DC source, or is zero in the DC source, zero in the DC source short term. Whereas the other end of the other terminal of DC source is ground. Right? So it is there is my VCC that is shorted here. Okay. So I want to solve this end. What is the out? I need one more equation. Where do I get that equation? Ds yes, equals V pi minus hmm? pi. V pi I. Ds equals V pi minus Re times I. E. Okay, so you, you're saying that V pi is Ds here minus voltage here. But I don't know the voltage down there. So it's giving me one extra variable. Let me write a KVR from here to ground. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Vs is going to be V pi, right? Plus VE. I'm not going to write VE. I'm going to see, I'm seeing a resistor here. I can multiply that resistor by the current through it to find the voltage. Right? So let's do that. So I'm embedding the KCR into my equation. So it's V pi plus RE, the resistor, times the current through it. What is the current to this resistor? Well, the current from the right side, that's easy, GMB5. What's the current from the left side? V pi over R5. V pi over R5? V pi over R5. You can say IB, but let's get another layer. Oh, okay. Just say V pi over R5. Okay. Now you have one equation where everything is a function of V pi. Okay? 
Always. So I can find the relationship between V pi and Vs. Great. Once I have that, plug it into here, I'll have a relationship between V out and Vs. Okay, let's do that. So V pi is Vs over 1 plus Vmre plus From here, Or therefore, A V, your V out of the VS, is going to be minus G and R C over. So, if you remember, R by is what? R by is beta over G M, right? This is G M plus. GM over beta. Right? 1 over alpha is going to be GM over beta. So this term is much, much smaller than your first term because beta is 100, 200, something like that. Right? So I'm going to ignore this. Let's make the equation nicer. Okay? So, what happened to my gain? When I added that resistor to the emitter. What was my initial gain? Or oh, you can actually cheat, say R E Z was zero. Your initial gain was GMRC. Now it is this much. What has happened to it? It's like approximately negative one. Well, R E and R C, you know, oh, it could be 5 yeah. kilos yeah. and 200 volts. Right? But what has happened to my gain? Stay more or less the same, increase or decrease? With some RE that is large, you know, large meaning you know, 100 ohms, compared to RC, maybe small. But GMRE is 40 millisiemens, right? For a million. A few hundred ohms here, you have a number that is on your order, maybe something between 1 and 10, usually. The other way to look at it is it's 1 plus some positive number. This is a positive number. It's 1 plus some positive number. Your gain has dropped, for sure. Yeah. Whatever you had before without RE, you have less of it now. What did you gain, or uh, what did you achieve for the price you paid in terms of gain? Stable bias. Stability and bias point. Stability and gain. Because if you look at it, you know, the nice thing about this expression is that where is the transistor here? If you choose a transistor with some random beta, doesn't matter. Some random IS, doesn't matter. And so that, as long as you set IC, you get your gain. Right? So this is really nice and convenient. But this is the price I paid. I traded gain for stability. I gave up a little bit of my gain, got some uh, stability back. This actually happens. So this is because of all that feedback thing that the resistance does, the RE does at the emitter of this device. You'll see that in a lot of systems, mechanical, thermal, optical, whatever. When you have feedback, you usually have less gain but more stability. You trade the system gain for more stable, predictable behavior. Okay? So that's what has happened. I've lost 
sum of my gain because I needed a stable bias for it. But there are situations that you may not want to do that. You may want to have your cake and eat it. You want to have a stable bias point, but as much gain as possible. What can I do? What is the change I can make here to make that happen? You could connect the outs to another. No, no, no. So, this circuit. So if I have more amplifiers, I can do anything. Actually, be careful. More than two stages of amplifiers usually is asking for trouble. Unless you know what you did. So don't do it. <laughs> Too early. But, but what can I do? What can I change about this stage to have a stable bias point and a high gain? We could make RE pretty small. Still, I have one plus GM RE. Right? So it, I'm going to lose a little bit of gain. I want all of it back. Do you use self bias? No, no, no. Biasing doesn't go messy. Don't you have higher input resistance for your input voltage? So forget about the input resistance. Just gain. I'm only worried about gain. What do I do? We already know the trick. Put a capacitor there. So what happens? At DC, your RE is doing its task. It makes your DC operating the bias point and everything else. It makes it stable. You have a good bias point and all that, right? So you're sure your IC is going to be. It, it needs to be. But at AC frequencies, if you choose this CD properly, it's going to act as a short circuit. It's like your RE. Basically, over here in that equation, you have to have instead of RE, you have RE in parallel with the impedance of that capacitor. If that capacitor is essentially a short circuit at your operating frequency, this term is gone. Your R is back to zero, right? And life is beautiful again. You get your maximum degree. So this is the second use of these capacitors in our circuit. So I, I said we, in this course we don't deal with capacitors just that much. We don't bring them into our analysis, but we use them. The first use was to couple two stages where you want their DCs to be independent of each other. That's a coupling capacitor. And here, we are bypassing this RE for AC operation, for small signal operation. So these are called bypass capacitors. Right? In both cases, the capacitor is chosen such that at the frequency that you're interested in, it has a much, much smaller impedance than everything else around it. Everything else around it, in this case, you look at to receive the impedance to the left of this capacitor. Let's say you figure out it is 100 ohms. You choose a capacitor that, let's say, at a megahertz has 10 ohms of impedance, or, or even less. Okay? Capacitors are cheap. You know, and a 10 nanofarad capacitor is the same price as a 100 nanofarad capacitor. Um, so if it essentially functions as a short circuit um, in the circuit, then what's to stop it becoming the original problem of an unstable bias? Well, RE, because in DC, yeah. this is just an open circuit. It doesn't do anything in DC. Okay. It only affects AC performance. Oh, okay. okay. Right? Now, that said, look at that formula again. Yeah. So RC is usually in the kilo ohms range, RE is usually in hundreds of ohms range for typical ICs on your millions, right? So GMRC is 10, 20, 30 times larger than, larger than GMRE. But GMRE can be large as well, right? Uh, at the end of the story, if you make this GMRE large compared to one, your gain is just RC over RE, or less, right? Some approximation. And that's the beautiful thing that, well, what does it tell you? My gain now doesn't depend on temperature because that VT is gone. Just ratios of two resistors. It's not that easy, but you can make it approach that. Let's say if I make this like five or 10, maybe I can ignore this. And if I ignore that, the two GMs cancel, it's just RC over R. So 
this poor guy, it, it helps with biasing a lot. But it can also help you with getting a more predictable AC game. Right? Because it is reducing the variations in GM, wherever they come from. It could be changing temperature, it could be whatever. It, re it reduces the dependence of your game on GM. So we like this term. But there's a price. You're paying in terms of our achievable game, total game. If you want to keep a little bit of RE for AC performance and you need a good amount of RE for DC performance, this is the circuit that you need to use. You bypass a portion of your RE, not part of it. You keep a little bit of it for AC stability. You need all of it for DC stability, and now your gain is GMRE1, your bias one is RE1 plus RE2. And so that, if you made um, GMRC pretty similar to GMRE, that would be how you'd make one of the... Um, gain of negative one. Yeah, gain of negative one. Or yeah, if, if RC and RE are about the same, you get the gain of minus one. Right. Almost the same. It's a bad way of getting in the of minus four, but there are better ways, but you have to get in. Alright? So, what is left of common emitter stage? It's the input resistance of the common emitter stage and the output resistance of common emitter stage. Let's go back to our basic one. I'm not going to keep you here for any longer. Just give me one moment, I want to show you how to do this stuff. Input resistance of a common emitter stage. And this is your output, so output resistance is from here. What is the input resistance? Tell me that. You know that. If I write it down, you tell me if it is right or not. We saw that before, last lecture. Whatever you have in the emitter circuit multiplied by beta shows up in the base circuit. This is another way of writing this. Show that they are, you can home, at home, show that they are the same thing. Another way of writing the same thing, right? So what I do is uh, I write for beta, I write GM over R pi, and you can do this, right? But the reason that I like to show it to you this way is that what happens to the input resistance when you add that RE? It goes up by the same factor that your gain drops. Right? You lose three times up, you know, your gain by a factor of three, you improve your input resistance by a factor of three. Usually we want the higher input resistance, the higher the level, right? So you lose a factor of 10 in your game, you increase your input resistance by a factor of 10. So that RE, that's another reason to keep a little bit of it. Not just because of the gain stability, but because maybe RI alone is not enough as the input resistance of your circuit. Maybe you want something higher. And that portion of RE that you keep will give you that extra input resistance. So that's easy. And then I suggest that you definitely try to solve this using the small signal circuit. What is our out? Hold on. Hmm? Oh, no, I have a previous question. Now I what our out is. What is our out? What is it when I look down collector? Infinite. Infinite. Down here is infinite. What is it when I look up? So that's RC. RC. So what is our out? RC. Right? You can you can do the small signal on the house. Do that. But um, good or bad? Not so good. 
Not so. Because, you know, remember, RC value is usually large, few kilowatts. For an output resistance, that's a large value. So this common emitter stage is great. It has a large voltage gain, forget about the negative sign. It can have a large input resistance, but unfortunately it has a large output resistance. So if it had a small output resistance, then you would just go and happily live with this thing forever. But uh, this is one drawback. Sorry, I, maybe I just didn't catch. Why is having a large, uh, large output resistance a negative? Well, you know, if, if, uh, if you remember the second I simulated, yeah. Yeah. if I go from, let's say, a 100 ohm load to 10 ohm load, yeah. all of a sudden the output amplitude drops. Okay, so it's about having a because, because whatever amplifier I have here, I can model it as this. So yeah. AB times DA and RL. Right? Okay. And if you attach a fixed load here, let's say 100 ohm load, you want all of that voltage to appear across RL. R out is wasting your signal. You want it to be much smaller than RL. So for a typical voltage amplifier, you want R out to be as small as possible. Okay. okay. So you had a question. Yeah, when you say amplifier, or when you say something's amplifying, is it like current or voltage? Or is it voltage? It's power. Yeah. So if you want to restrict its power, right? So what is the current gain for a common emitter amplifier? If I short the output, the collector to ground, what is IC to ID, the input? If you short the... Yeah, because I want the maximum current, right? It's going to be beta, right? Yeah. IC to ID. Mm -hmm. So you have a large current gain, you have a large voltage gain. You should have, uh, you know... We would be happy with living with this thing if it had and the small output resistance. It has everything. It has current gain, it has voltage gain, it has a high input resistance, it has high voltage gain, but a large output resistance. That messes it up. Because if you want to use an audio amplifier, if you want to make it to an 8 ohm speaker, your RC now has to be 1 ohm. An RC of 1 ohm doesn't give you any gain. GMRC, remember? Right? So the output resistance that is high here is the disappointment. Nonetheless, it's a really good stage. We'll talk about the other two stages and we'll see how uh, we can add this at output resistance issue. Any questions? For the resistance in, where is the data come out? Beta B, uh, so last lecture or the lecture before that, when I said, uh, when I was talking about the resistance at the base, uh, at the node, we did the calculation. Just stick around for a moment, I'll do the whole analysis in the, in the tutorial. But, you know, if, if you accept this one, GMR by is beta. Right? But it's, uh, here is another way to look at it. You send ID in. The voltage drop across this guy is IERG. So when I look at the voltage changes here, VB over ID here, the effect of this is beta times higher. The effect of small ID change here is going to be a small ID change. ID is about beta times rho. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I will have, it looks like I have a much bigger impedance than I actually do. Okay, so. That's all for today. We went uh, about half an hour over time. Um, if there are no more questions, then I just stick around for the tutorial. Sorry? So let's take.